Well, in the summer of 1986, two ships actually collided in the Black Sea just south of Russia. And one was a liner carrying 1,234 people, and the other was a freighter carrying cargo of oats. And a result of this collision between these two ships, a huge hole was ripped in the side of the liner carrying all the passengers. And it actually sank within 15 minutes, so quick that they didn't have time to, to launch the, the cargo, uh, uh, sorry, the lifeboats. And 398 people tragically lost their lives on that day as they were thrown into the icy cold water. They only managed to recover 116 of the bodies and uh, 282, the other 282 were listed as missing. But the news of the disaster was further darkened when the investigation revealed that, that the real cause of the accident wasn't a technology problem, like a radar malfunctioning or something like that. It wasn't thick fog. The cause of the problem was actually human stubbornness. It was human stubbornness. Each captain was aware of the other ship's presence nearby. Both could have steered clear, but according to the news reports and investigation, neither captain wanted to give way to the other. Each was too proud to yield first. And by the time they actually came to their senses, it was too late and the tragedy struck. And what we see here is that stubborn pride is actually really harmful. And it's deceptive and it misleads us. And sometimes it can have serious and even fatal consequences. And this morning as we we're looking at our, our Daniel series, we're continuing on faith in a post-Christian world. We're looking at chapter 5 which also deals with the stubborn pride of a king, a king of Babylon, that had fatal consequences. And in chapters 4 and 5, God is dealing both with the first king of Babylon and the, also the last king of Babylon. And they both had issues with pride. The first king, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, we saw that he did yield. And that he did come to his senses, if you remember last week's message or you've read the, the chapter after being humbled by God, that is. But the second king, we will see, doesn't come, doesn't come to his senses until it is too late. Pride is a significant issue, as we see in Daniel in the kingdom of Babylon. But it is also uh, a significant issue for us in our day and in our lives, and it's something that we're going to have to battle against daily, probably for the rest of our lives, I'm sure. I know it is in my case. But the danger is it can seriously uh, affect our judgment, and it can have harmful consequences. But as we look at Daniel 5, I just want to give you some, some really important and interesting background that helps us to make sense and understand what's actually going on. And you need to understand it's probably been about 25 years between, between chapter 4 and chapter 5, something around there. 25 years has passed. The nation of Judah is nearing nearly 70 years of being in exile in the Babylon, uh, city of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar has died since chapter 4, um, and since his reign, which was about 43 years, there's been a whole lot of, um, there have been several other kings, there's been uh, assassinations, there's been power grabs and things like that. But we're told in chapter 5 that, that now the king of Babylon is um, Belshazzar, although he was not actually the king, his father uh, Nabonidus was the king, so he was kind of the second ruler. He was a co-regent because his father, Nabonidus, had just gone off into the desert somewhere for what we understand to be religious reasons, you know, to worship the moon god and to exalt the moon god, as we understand. And so he went away and left his son, Belshazzar, uh, in charge. And, and what's really interesting, I just want to encourage you with, is that, that for a long time, uh, people thought, well, because Belshazzar was the king, the Bible's wrong because the last known uh, recorded king of Babylon before it fell was uh, Nabonidus. But the Bible said it's Belshazzar and there was no record of Belshazzar, so the Bible must be wrong. And so, again, instead of uh, waiting to, for uh, further information to come to hand to prove the Bible to be true, it was dismissed as being false. But it was in the middle of the 19th century that, that a cylinder was discovered through uh, archaeology and it was called the Nabonidus cylinder. So actually, Nabonidus had actually written on there about his son Belshazzar being left in charge of Babylon. And so once again, the Bible's proven to be historically accurate and true. And I just find that really encouraging, that, that the Bible is historically accurate and reliable, and it gets proven over and over again. 
So Belshazzar is king, second in a ruler, co-regent, co-regent ruler with his father who's out in, in, in the desert somewhere. But as far as the people in Babylon were concerned, he was king. He, excuse me, he was ruler. And also to set the scene, we need to understand that it's the, we know it's uh, 539 BC because that's the year Babylon fell. It's recorded in history, 539 BC. But on this night, the night that the kingdom fell, outside the city walls was this massive invading army, the Medo-Persian army. And they had laid siege to this magnificent city of Babylon. They were fresh from victory, conquering any other kind of resistance that had come in their path. But the reality is that this city was, this great city was impenetrable because it had these huge walls, strong, thick, high walls, and not only outer walls, but inner walls, and it was also surrounded by a moat. And so penetration into the city was was impossible. But the occupying army uh, also had uh, no... Sorry, the, in, the, the army inside Babylon had no reason to come out because of that security. And they had the river Euphrates flowing through the city, so they had permanent water supply. Permanent water supply. They weren't going to run out of water. And they had food stores, it's understood, for, for many, many years. So they could actually sit inside the city and survive for many years, no problem, while the, the, the army outside maybe got hungry and tired and weary of hanging around. But on this night, nonetheless, these soldiers from the Persian and Median Medo army were sharpening their swords. They were getting ready for an invasion. They had an innovative and a surprising attack that would be launched later this night. Now we change the scene again to to verse 1 of our text. As we look at our passage, we can see... uh, to the king's palace, we would expect to find that for a city under siege, perhaps the king would be on high alert, perhaps he would be engaged in military meetings and discussing battle plans to defend the city. But what we actually find is is quite different from that, far from that. Read with me in verse 1. King Belshazzar, he made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. What is King Belshazzar doing in the face of war? He's having a party, he's having a feast, he's having a festival. He's getting drunk in front of a thousand of his lords and probably everyone else that came with them. So confident was he in the security of his walls that he had no reason to fear. There was no need to take the threat seriously and it would seem to be a a reckless decision. But it gets much worse, continuing on in verse 2. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, be brought that her king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the kings and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and they praised the God of silver, bronze, gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Bad idea, huh? Bad idea. I mean, anyone reading this with a reverence for God just cringes at this point. Just cringes. You know, these are the vessels of God, God's vessels that are sacred and holy and set apart for the, for the worship of God. You know, and, and it was bad enough that they weren't in the temple being used to worship God because his people were in exile and his temple had been destroyed. But to make matters worse, they were now in this debaucherous party of drunkenness being used to praise the gods, pagan gods of, of Babylon. And what even makes worse is that, 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 that this party with the presence of the king's wives and the concubines was very culturally inappropriate. And so it suggests to us that, that there was a, a, a great intention for this to be a very sensual um, and sexual type of party. And this is the type of party that God's sacred vessels were being used to mock God to praise and worship um, their false gods, their pagan gods. You know, perhaps in the mind of Belshazzar, there was no god or kingdom that was able to come and to bring him down. He was superior to all. And at this time of testing and war, he was just letting everybody know that. But what we can observe is that things have gone downhill quite a bit since chapter 4. You might remember that Nebuchadnezzar, who understandably... um, 
so we understand it's probably Belshazzar's grandfather, not actually his father, it was just used, referred to as a father as a cultural term, um, same way that the, the Jews would have done so, like as in Father Abraham. Uh, he was returned to his father, probably a grandfather. He was also a very proud man. We saw that in chapter 4 and the preceding chapters. But at the end of chapter 4, he actually praised God. He praised God as the one who lives forever. And this is what he said. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? And further, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. You know, finally, Nebuchadnezzar got it. He got that God was the most high God. But then we see this sudden transition from Nebuchadnezzar's praise at the end of chapter 4 to Belshazzar's high-handed uh, blasphemy and mockery of God at the beginning of chapter 5. And, and it shows this transition. It shows that the nation's ultimate rejection of God and who he is. But it seems that their view of God was even worse than it was before Nebuchadnezzar was humbled. Because Nebuchadnezzar, as proud as he was, he was never going to do anything so stupid as to bring those vessels of God into such a party as this and mock God, to mock a pagan God. He was too superstitious for that. He didn't want to bring any kind of judgment upon himself if a God had any kind of power that would threaten him. But Belshazzar, he had no hesitation, no hesitation to defile what was sacred to God, the God of the Jews. You know, when we think of Belshazzar's party, it's hard not to, to think about our post-Christendom culture, isn't it? You know, in our materialistic and consumeristic society, for many, life is just a feast to be enjoyed. It's to do whatever gives the most pleasure, to do whatever is desired, and to take, live like there's no tomorrow, each doing what is right in their own eyes. And it makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense that with this increasing value in society that, that everyone should be able to do what is right in their own eyes. It makes sense that we reject, or God is rejected and mocked. The Christian faith is mocked because it, it claims exclusive truth and moral accountability to God. And as we've seen in Daniel, Babylon was a pluralistic society, just like ours is. And so for God to be recognised as the most high God would obviously mean that he would have to be worshipped and obeyed above others. But there'd be no two ways about that. And so it's not a great surprise that even uh, though Nebuchadnezzar confessed God as the Most High, by the time Belshazzar was king, the Most High God was back on the bottom of the pile. And it's no surprise that in our society that, that our God, it's okay to worship him, but please do that in the privacy of your church or in the privacy of your homes. And so Belshazzar, he's got this wild party going on, he's getting drunk with wine. But you know what? It's the intoxication of his pride that was the real problem, not the wine. It's the intoxication of his pride that led him to make some very foolish judgments and to become dull to the reality of his life before God. You know, in that intoxication of his pride, he, he elevated himself above God by, by mocking him and defiling his sacred vessels. He formed the, the, the false sense of security inside his city walls that no god or kingdom was going to come inside and do harm to him. And as such, he, he believed, behaved with just such arrogance, thinking he could say and he could do whatever he liked without consequence. His pride had caused a very distilled view of reality. And as Belshazzar is raising God's holy vessels, you know, toasting and praising the gods of the, the wine and the gold and the silver, wood, stone, bronze, you can't help but feel as you read this that things aren't going to go too well for you, Belshazzar. Things aren't going to go too well. And sure enough, the next thing we see is God crash the party. Verse 5. Immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as he wrote, as it wrote. And then the king's colour changed. And his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. You know, when God crashed this party, the king was reduced to, 
to knee knocking. To knee knocking. It's a, it's a silly sight to think about, but he was, in ter- he was terrified. And some commentators even take it to mean that when his limbs gave way, that, that it means that he actually sawed himself, that he was so scared. Now, whether that's actually true, what happened, or whether it's just a metaphorical expression, the point is that he was terrified. His knees were knocking and his limbs gave way. And why wouldn't he be? Why wouldn't he be terrified? Because Belshazzar had only worshipped you know, his false gods, his fake gods, gods that were made by human hands, gods that were statues and lived on shelves and lived in buildings, never heard them speak or do anything. And if an invading army wanted to come and represent their god, they had to actually carry their god with them. But now he was witnessing the power of the living God, the revelation of the living God who had come inside his city walls into his palace and was riding on his wall in the middle of his party when he was on display for all his lords. So it's no surprising that he's terrified. He's in panic. Verse 7, The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. He's desperate to know what this message means. He's giving away purple clothing because that's the sign of uh, the colour of royalty. And as the co-regent, the second ruler, because his father, remember, was the first ruler, he can only give away the third position in the kingdom. So again, proving the biblical historicity. So the king was alarmed He'd seen this writing on the wall. Sorry, just going back a bit bit to the previous verse. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his colour changed, and his lords were perplexed, confused, and scratching their head. So so we saw that the king was alarmed when he saw the writing, and now when he doesn't, no one can explain to him what it means, he's greatly, he's greatly alarmed couldn't understand it. What does it mean? And once again, we see, as being repeated all through Daniel, that, that the, the, all the wisdom in the kingdom of Babylon could not understand and interpret uh, the, the mysteries of God, things that, that needed to be spiritually uh, perceived by the Spirit. Then if Belshazzar hadn't been humiliated enough already, if you can imagine this scene, in comes the queen. The queen mother probably is not, not his wife because his wife was already at the party. But she comes into the room and shows him up. He's in a panic. He's made a mess of himself. His lords are all confused and he doesn't know what to do, he doesn't know what this message means. He's making a big flap and a big fuss. And the queen comes in and basically tells this guy to pull himself together pull himself together, and she says, there's this guy within the walls who's able to tell you what this message means. From verse 10, we read, The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts or your uh, alarm you or your colour change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Again, there's this recognition that Daniel's not like everyone else. He's got something in him that makes him special. It's the Spirit of God. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, Nazar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers. Because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king now named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will show you the interpretation. Do you notice how highly she speaks of Daniel here? The confidence that she has in him. He will show you. He will show you the interpretation because she knew him. She'd seen him do this before. You know, Daniel had not been forgotten by the queen. She knew and respected him and uh, the spirit of God she recognised was in him. And you get a sense here too that the queen is actually dropping a a hint for Belshazzar. That she should know this guy. You should know about him. Because she said, your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, the king, made him chief of the wise men. Your father knew about him. Your father recognised how important he was, how the wisdom that he had, the spirit that he had. 
But what about you? And it's just another clue how things have regressed since Nebuchadnezzar. Now Daniel and his friends aren't on the scene here despite his most excellent reputation. And Belshazzar no doubt wanted nothing to do with the Jewish exiles or their God and he only had disdain for them which we see come through in the next verse if you read in verse 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah. You know, previously, Nebuchadnezzar had highly honored Daniel and made him like a second in charge, the ruler of all the province of Babylon. But Belshazzar just wants to put him down here and put him in his place. You're just that one of those exiles. You're just one of those exiles, those Jewish exiles. He puts him down, but he still wants his help. But Daniel's not faced. He's probably in his 80s by this time, and he's not going to be unsettled by anything Belshazzar says. Belshazzar says to him in verse 14, I have heard of you that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now, wise men, the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show me the interpretation of the matter. But I've heard that you can give interpretation and solve problems. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler of the, in the kingdom. Well, you kind of get the sense here that this, is, this also just becomes business as, as usual for Daniel, don't you? You know, as we've seen in the past, in the previous chapters, that, that he's always ready for service. He's always ready to be faithful to, to God, to do God's work. And once again, by God's spirit, he provides an interpretation, the word of God to Belshazzar, speaking on his behalf. But before he does provide the interpretation, he actually goes into this, this dialogue uh, in what we might sort of equate to sentencing remarks. And it's just like in a, in a, in a courtroom, in a trial, that before a, a, a judge comes in to deliver the verdict, the sentence, he or she will actually give a, a whole range of sentencing remarks based on the evidence that's been presented and the review of that evidence. And so, first of all, you see these sentencing remarks that God is speaking to Belshazzar through, through Daniel. First of all, in verse 17, Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I'll read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. So God, God's words can't be bought, Belshazzar. And they will not be tainted by bribery. Keep them for yourself. Reading on, O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. God gave that to him. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations and languages, languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew, until he knew that the most high God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you, and your lords, and your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath, your breath, and whose are all your ways you have not honoured. What an indictment. And what's worse, as we saw his, see here, his sin and his rejection of God was deliberate. It was deliberate. Belshazzar, you knew, you knew all this. You know, in these words, Daniel told the story of Nebuchadnezzar, whom God had humbled to live as a, a beast in the field until he knew that God was the, the most high God, which, which was God's grace to him. 
It was God's grace to him to turn him away from his proud heart and to, to see God and to know God for who he truly is. But what Daniel is saying here is that this was actually also God's grace to you, Belshazzar. You were to learn from this, that you might humble your heart and be saved. But actually knowing this, Belshazzar, you rejected God's grace and you actually opposed God, the God who holds your breath in his hands. But now it was too late for Belshazzar to come to his senses, it's his senses whose foolishness was exposed by these charges. And we see that the mocker of God only proved himself to be a fool. And such is the result of the intoxication of, of pride that it would lead to such foolishness, such a delusion of reality. And now Daniel gives the interpretation of the words from verse 24. And then from his presence the hand was sent and this writing was inscribed and this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Belshazzar, you have been weighed. You have been weighed and found wanting. God has numbered the days of your kingdom, numbered the days of your life, and he's brought both to an end. You did not honor me. You profaned my name. You rejected the truth about me, and you, you exchanged it for a lie. You worship these created idols instead of the creator. And instead of humbling yourself and learning from the grace and the wisdom I gave to your father, you you lifted yourself up against me. And this was both a judgment against Belshazzar personally, but also a judgment against the kingdom. But, but what an indictment for Belshazzar as the king, as the ruler, to, to lead that kingdom into the peril of God's judgment. And so for him and the kingdom, the fate was sealed. What God had written surely would be if you remember the first scene, it was probably then around this time that the invasion plan, perhaps, uh, of the Medo-Persian army was in full swing. Perhaps they had already breached the walls and were inside the city. And we actually have ancient records of how this took place. There was a Greek historian, Herodotus, who, who wrote about it. And he described the fall of Babylon in, in detail and showed us how the invaders got in. And he says that the, the, actually what the Medo-Persians did was they got upstream of the Euphrates River and they diverted the water into a nearby basin or swamp, an area like that, so that the water of the Euphrates River dropped. And so the gates of Babylon that were guarding the river uh, were then exposed, and they could go in and wade through and get underneath. And so this was totally unexpected by the people in Babylon, and they, came, they went in uh, as a surprise and took the city. And he actually even makes mention... <laughs> Uh, Herodotus of the party of this festival that was going on in the city this, this party that's in Daniel chapter 5 and so in verse 29 then Belshazzar gave the command after hearing these words and Daniel was clothed with the purple a chain of gold and was put around his neck and proclamation was made about him that he should be the ruler in the, th in the kingdom the very night Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed and Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. You know, what I find interesting about this text, apart from uh, this rather empty command of Belshazzar at the end to, to promote Daniel and to give him the rewards that he promised, he's actually gone very quiet. He's actually gone very quiet. Like at the start of the chapter, he's in full swing, he's in full voice, drunken party, yes, toasting gods and all of this, Who's going to come in and take me and, and destroy my kingdom? Full of voice, full of confidence, full of arrogance. But now before the Lord, before the word of the Lord, his mouth is shut. There's no comeback. There's no mitigating circumstances. There's no answer or response. Belshazzar had been sobered by God's judgment, by God's word. It's a pretty heavy text. It's a pretty heavy story. You know, from, from a, a Belshazzar's point of view, from a Babylonian point of view, it's what we call a tragedy in the structure of a story. It starts bad and it gets worse. We like comedies mostly that, that start up here, they get bad, and then they come good again. 
This is actually quite a heavy story, uh, showing God's judgment. But you think about it, it's sobered, this judgment of uh, God sobered Belshazzar very quickly. It's probably the fastest sober up in, in history, perhaps. But it should actually uh, sober us up as well. It should make us sober. The passage, if we look at it, offers really great hope for believers because for all the wickedness in the world and the opposition against God, he will not be mocked. He will not be mocked and his justice will stand and his glory will be revealed and our faith in him will be vindicated. So in our, in our community, in our society, when God is being mocked and we've been made to feel like, uh, just get out of here, we don't want you or whatever, we can stand firm, we can be strong because we know that God's justice will stand. Our faith will be vindicated. He will not be mocked. And for the Jews in exile, it would have been a great, great, given them great hope to see that God is actually he's with them. God is in control. And he is bringing down the kingdoms of, of man, the kingdoms of this world, as he promised to do in the dream of chapter 2, to progress to this kingdom, to his eternal kingdom that he would set up, as we know through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, this eternal kingdom. And we know that Jesus, the rock, has come and he is building this kingdom through his church, which the gates uh, of hell will not prevail against. Amen? But this passage also calls us to live as faith and exiles in this world by by being sober-minded, by being sober-minded. Let me explain what I mean. Because while we have a great hope before us, the joy of our salvation, this great and glorious hope of Jesus Christ through salvation in his name, there are, there are many people in this world that are rejecting Jesus, that are rejecting Christ. And tragically, they are destined to face his judgment. And the consequences of their, their pride will prove fatal. You know, people, people are living lives intoxicated by their, their pride, unwilling to humble themselves before God, to admit their sin before him, to confess their need of him as a saviour. People that are in our families, people that we work with, people that we study with and go to school with, people that we go on trips with and things like that. You know, Daniel, they, he lived pretty much all of his life in this exile in Babylon. And, and no doubt, he, he became part of that community. He was obviously one of the, the rulers, for, uh, leaders for a long time. But no doubt, he, he probably met friends and made relationships and things like that. I have no doubt that Daniel had concern for those people in Babylon. They were also sobered because they were actually experiencing the discipline of the law themselves as a nation because they had been exiled from their land, from Jerusalem. And now they were also seeing this judgment on, on the Babylonians. And the, and the, the, the thing is that... that that even though they were in exile, God's, we saw that God works redemptively through that. That God was working through Daniel and his friends and perhaps through the other um, people of God in that community as well to bring about his grace to the Babylonians. And often we see this, that, that God is always bringing more than one plan together. And perhaps while he was using the Babylonians to bring about his judgment on the unfaithful Israelites, he brought the Israelites to the uh, Babylonians and then work through them to bring grace to the Babylonians. And we hear about perhaps Nebuchadnezzar's conversion. I think it is. It doesn't actually say that he was Christian and will see him in heaven. It doesn't say those words. But I, that's my feeling when I read the text, that he gave glory to God. He was humbled. God's work was sufficient in his life. And I expect to see him in heaven. That's one man. That was a king. But should we not expect that through the work of God in those lives of the Israelites, that perhaps others came to know God and trust in him? And so it's a reminder for us that as exiles uh, living in this post-Christian world, citizens of heaven, that, that yes, there is a judgment, there is going to be a day of reckoning, and we, we need to be concerned for the people around us. We need to be urgent that they are woken up from the intoxication of their pride, that they are sobered up, and that they begin to see and to know who God really is. You know, this passage, though, is not calling us to run around to people who we see living in sin and say, mene, mene, tekel, parson. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. It's not saying that. Wipe that smile off your face because God's judgment is upon you. We're not supposed to run around and do that. But we need to tell them about the love and grace of Jesus Christ who humbled himself. He humbled himself. He came and he was born as a man. He came from heaven. He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. This is what Philippians tells us. 
but he humbled himself and he came and, and obedience to God even to the point of death on the cross. Why would he do that? Because we needed saving. We couldn't help ourselves. We, we have this problem of sin. We have this heart of pride and we needed to be humbled before the God and it was the humility of Christ that would do that for us. And he died on the cross and he took the punishment for our sin the punishment that we deserve, the judgment that we deserve, so that we never need to fear judgment again. Never again. In this story, God wrote a message on the wall which will stand against all who belong to this world and who choose to reject God. This message that you have been weighed and found wanting. God's words tells us that all have sinned and all fall short of God's glory. So we will need to graciously uh, and, and, and sensitively help people understand their sin before the Lord, that they need, their need of him. But when we trust in Jesus, God writes something else. God writes something else. He writes our names in the Lamb's book of life. He tells us that in Revelation. And, and, and in that book, our names will never be blotted out, never blotted out of that book. This book with our names shows that we are in his kingdom, that we have received eternal life from him. And our name will never be blotted out because his blood has blotted out our sin forever. He's washed us clean. He's blotted us out. I think, friends, what I'm trying to say here is that that We want to preach the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. That's true. That's for sure. But there is still this reality, this tension that we have to hold in life. That yes, there's this great and glorious hope. We have a saviour who has saved us. He has plucked us from death. He has rescued us from sin. And we never have to face judgment again. But there's this joy of that. There's this joy of our salvation. But there's also this tension that there is judgment. There is judgment for, for the rest of the people in this world. And that that should sober us so that we actually are urgent about that and want to do something about it and reach to the people, reach out to them. And what we're seeing here at the cross is that how can God be both the just and the justifier, which Paul tells us he is in Romans? How can God just take sin so seriously that he just wants to judge it and purge it and wipe it out from, from his creation? How can he be that guy and also be the loving father that just wants to rescue you and doesn't want to see you lost. Peter says that, that the Father is, not, uh, is holding off his judgment, not because he's slow in keeping his promises, because he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. So how can we reconcile this loving God who loves people and doesn't want to see anyone perish with this justice of God that just can't, won't stand sin, sin, he won't tolerate it, and he's going to deal with it? How do we bring those together? Well, that's the cross. That's the cross. And this is what's so amazing about it. That at the cross, God is both the just and the justifier. In his justice, he has dealt with the sin by pouring out his wrath on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is dealt with, it is finished. God is just, he has not let sin go. But he's also the loving God and he says, I don't want to punish you for that. I don't want to lose you. So I'm, I'm putting that punishment for your sin on my son. Jesus took it for us. Jesus took it for us. And that's the gospel. That's the gospel. And so, as exiles living by faith in this world, we need to be clear-minded, sober-minded. So we need to understand the the times that we're living in, that we're living in these last days, and that, that this church age is about salvation. This church age is about God bringing people to repentance. And while there's, there's so much in this life that God has blessed us with and he wants us to enjoy, and I don't wanna, I'm not trying to speak against that in any way, sometimes I feel like we need a little bit of a sober up that, that the times that we're living in are the last days. And the Bible says that Jesus can return at any moment. We don't know when, the time or the hour. It could be today. And, and he'll come, and, and he'll come as either a friend or a judge. And we need to just be diligent about his work, his mission in this world, to be caring, to be urgent, to be wanting to see the people that are in our lives come to, to know him. And we, we also need to be sober-minded that we, that we know that we're living our, our lives before him, our, all of our lives before him. We're his image bearers. God's vessels in this story were used to um, profane God, 
and they were um, used in a very inappropriate way, but the Bible tells us that now we are the vessels of the Holy Spirit, that we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we are God's holy vessels, holy instruments. And so let us uh, not engage in the, the sin of the world and that the you know, frivolity of the world that would just dishonour God because we are his image bearers. We want to represent him and Christ well. Um, that people might see us and see in us the spirit of God as they saw in Daniel. That there's something different about that person, that there's something I can see in that person that is attractive to me. Let us, let us live our lives with the mind of Christ, the mind of Christ that is ours in him, and to make the most of our days and opportunities with the people that are in our lives. Let's pray.